So today we will be going over the clinical considerations for airway management in patients with ankylosing spondylitis. First, we will go over the overview of ankylosing spondylitis and airway considerations. Ankylosing spondylitis, also known as radiographic axial spondyloarthritis, it's a chronic immune-mediated inflammatory disease, primarily affects the axial skeleton, the spine, and the sacroiliac joints, Main features include inflammation and new bone formation. Structural damage leads to spine stiffness and loss of mobility. Peripheral sites and other organs can be involved. And pathogenesis is likely multifactorial. There could be a genetic susceptibility leading to HLA-B27 association. Environmental factors like mechanical stress, toxins, and microbiomes and affects approximately 0.5% of U.S. adults. And the average age at onset is 25 to 28 years. And many patients would not know about this diagnosis as late as 10 to 15 years after the first onset. There's a new bone formation and structural changes that occur. There's a syndesmocyte formation and ankylosing um, spondylitis is formed. AS belongs to a family of overlapping conditions. So here we will go over the wide spectrum of spondyloarthritis. There could be axial spondyloarthritis, could be undifferentiated peripheral spondyloarthritis, reactive arthritis, peripheral spondyloarthritis, radiographic axial spondyloarthritis, non-radiographic, psoriatic arthritis, and IBD-associated. And the delays in diagnosis are common and associated with irreversible damage and worse outcomes. Coming on to the treatment of ankylosing spondylitis, so main goals and options. So first, the goals of the treatment are to alleviate symptoms, improve the functioning, maintain the ability to work and perform daily activities, decrease the disease complications, and prevent skeletal damage as much as possible. Treatment options are physical therapy and exercise. Pharmacotherapy includes NSAIDs, conventional synthetic DMARDX, and these are recommended only in patients with uh, prominent peripheral arthritis, where biologic therapies are not available. And biologic DMARDS could be monoclonal antibodies and small molecule JAK inhibitors. So there's a wide range of treatment options available, and we can cater to the patient's needs. Coming on to the anatomic airway changes that occur in patients with ankylosing spondylitis. There is a radiologic cervical spine involvement in AS patients, and more than 50% of the patients have this. 70% of the patients by 20 years of disease progression develop radiologic changes. There's a characteristic bamboo spine due to the ossification of spinal ligaments and calcification of outer fibers of the annulus fibrosis of the intervertebral disc. And here in this figure, you can see there's a fixed forward kyphosis and there's a loss of mobility of thoracic and the cervical spine. Risk of vertebral fracture in ankylosing spondylitis. There's a high risk of spinal fractures independent of osteoporosis. Estimated prevalence is really high, as high as 10%. So this study that was published in Dermatology in 1994, there was a study of 122 patients with uh, spine fractures and 112 patients with ankylosing spondylitis. And majority of the fractures, they had a transdiscal extension injuries most commonly affecting C6, C7 level. And 58% of these patients had spinal cord injury. So you can see there's a very high incidence of spinal cord injury in these patients. So moving on to the airway mechanics in AS patients and the clinical implications. So in a normal patient who does not have ankylosing spondylitis, we need to have normal airway mechanics in order to accomplish a smooth and, and good airway uh, management. But in these patients with ankylosing spondylitis, we have a disruption of the airway mechanics that can actually lead to catastrophic complications. So the structural changes in cervical spine increase the susceptibility to low energy trauma, limited mouth opening due to 
TM joint involvement is there and challenges with directly laryngoscopy and leading to difficult tracheal intubation. So we will go over the airway management in patients with ankylosing spondylitis in pre-hospital settings. We will be doing case-based discussions for pre-hospital, for the hospital patients, as well as in the setting of COVID-19. First, I will be going over um, a case study in which we will be managing a patient um, in the pre-hospital setting. So first case study is about a 65-year-old man with ankylosing spondylitis and rheumatoid arthritis who presented with focal uh, cervical spinal pain after a fall. The patient was leaning on a plastic table that gave out, hit back the head and neck on the way down, there was no loss of consciousness during the fall, and the patient was able to ambulate after the fall. He denied any dizziness or lightheadedness prior to falling. So how do we recognize and assess the presence of AS in the field? This is very important for our first responders to know the signs and symptoms and how to manage these patients. Assess for any obvious or subtle neck or spine deformity. Inspect for medical alerts or emergency information that could be in the form of bracelets, necklace, or smartphones. Question the family members or friends about the presence of any chronic spine issues. In the patients who in, of AS who have experienced a fall or trauma and complained of acute back or neck pain, assume that a spinal fracture is present unless it's proven otherwise. Spinal immobilization of patients with AS in emergency pre-hospital setting is one of the most important things to remember. So these patients should not be treated same as anybody who does not have AS. The usual stabilization devices or stabilization um, forms cannot be used in patients with AS, cervical collars, or rigid backboards may cause spinal fractures and subsequently lead to neurological damage. Splinting in place with sufficient padding materials is a safer alternative means of cervical Im um, immobilization or stabilization in patients with AS. Minimizing the neck manipulation during emergency airway management. So when you're in the field or pre-hospital setting, there are a lot of devices that may not be available, but if we follow the general principle, we can accomplish safe airway management of these patients, even in the pre-hospital setting. Maintain adequate oxygenation with bag mass ventilation or with the supraglottic device. If intubation is essential, consider devices that include video laryngoscopic technology. If endotracheal intubation is emergently needed, a surgical airway is a reasonable approach, but we need to be very, very careful in patients who have flipped fixed flexion deformities in those patients' access to front of neck may not be possible. Coming on to the transfer of care of these patients from the pre-hospital setting, inform all the relevant healthcare providers about the presence or a possibility of AS and provide detailed information about the treatment modifications that were implemented in the pre-hospital setting. So a good handoff is really important in this situation. So now coming back to our case. So now our patient comes to the emergency department. On the review of systems, there were no pain, numbness, tingling, or weakness of the extremities. No pain in any other area of the body, and the bowel and bladder function was normal. The objective findings, there was no evidence of bleeding, CT head was negative for bleed, chest x-ray was negative for any rib fractures, and MRI and CT cervical spine demonstrated an unstable C6, C7 fracture. The patient was transferred to a tertiary care center for surgery, and in that hospital, the patient underwent a C5 to T1 stabilization, and there was a posterior arthrodesis that was done from C5 to T1. So the airway management was accomplished with video laryngoscope and manual inline stabilization. 
So now moving forward to airway management in patients with ankylosing spondylitis in a hospital setting. 55-year-old man with ankylosing spondylitis with multiple other medical problems. In December 2018, the patient presented with the neck pain after impact injury. He was sitting in a wheelchair, was pushed by a young family member, and the patient was ran into a pole sitting on the wheelchair. Right area of the neck became sore. Physical therapy helped him with the range of motion of neck. In March 2019, rhizotomy of the right cervical spine was done. July 2020, neurosurgery clinic had this patient presenting with neck pain that had been worsening over the last few months. Location of the pain was on the left side of the neck and radiating to the clavicle bilaterally. Pain characteristics were constant, dull, tingling, sore, or lightning or shock-like pain intermittently, and constant aching that the patient was having. As was associated with intermittent left neck and face numbness, there was no pain radiating down the arms or the legs, and there was no ataxia or recent falls. There was no bladder or bowel incontinence that was noted by the patient. But the patient reported that his cervical uh, kyphosis had worsened than the previous years. So the past medical history included AS, with chronic cervical kyphosis, hypertension, obesity, venous insufficiency with stasis ulcer, and the patient was a heavy smoker, smoking up to three and a half to four packs per day. And the patient has an intrathecal pump with hydromorphone for his chronic pain management. So on further imaging, the CT scan showed a new type two dense fracture, and the cervical x-rays demonstrated the anterior displacement of the known fracture that you can see on this x-ray. And the patient was directly sent to ED for admission. So then he underwent an occipital to T7 fusion with T3 PSO reduction of C2 fracture with mobile intraop CT scan. Postoperatively, the patient was transferred to neuro ICU for further monitoring and management and the patient remained in the hospital for two weeks and was discharged in the stable condition. So an individualized approach was done for the airway management um, of this patient. So these are the things to consider for the airway management in a hospital setting. Overall clinical condition, any specific airway anatomy, what equipment we have available, and the caregiver skills are really important. So here are the risks that are associated with chronic cervical kyphosis from AS. Neck extending procedures carry a very high risk of neurological injury. The vertebral basilar insufficiency from bony encroachment on the vertebral artery can occur. So neck extension acutely and severe neck extension can be extremely dangerous in these patients. So we will go over the direct and indirect approaches to tracheal intubation in patients with AS. Direct laryngoscopy that is usually used in patients who do not have any AS or any spine problems, it has a low first pass success and high complication rate in patients with AS or patients with difficult airway. It is not recommended and avoided if possible. Venial laryngoscopy has an easy learning curve. It is comparable to fiber optic intubation in some situations, but it may not be safer or more effective option than a fiber optic intubation in certain situations if the patients have severe TM joint damage, limited mouth opening, or they are fixed cervical deformities. Fiber optic intubation is the safest approach. It allows for neurological monitoring during the tracheal intubation process. It is a viable option for patients with severe chin-on-chest deformity, but it needs a lot of patient cooperation and the provider skills to perform a successful fiber optic intubation. So here are a few alternatives to awake fiber optic intubation for patients with AS, those who are undergoing elective surgery, or even sometimes during the emergency surgery. But these can be done only in anesthetized patients. Video-assisted nasotracheal intubation is an option 
And the angel mask areas are very helpful in these situations. Use a classic LMA or an intubation LMA can be used to accomplish a successful airway management. So laryngeal mask airways for the patients with ankylosing spondylitis. So I'll go over a few details and see how we can accomplish a successful airway intubation with these techniques. The advantages that we have here, laryngeal visualization is not necessary. Trachea can be intubated without any head or neck movement. Ventilation can be maintained during the procedure. But there are certain limitations. May be difficult in cases that have severely limited mouth opening, less than 1.2 centimeters for an LMA, and less than 2 centimeters for an intubating LMA. Patients who have large cervical osteophytes or patients who have fixed extension deformity. LMAs are more suitable if the mouth opening is less than 2 centimeters and or the intubation is not required. It can be challenging to intubate through an LMA. Intubating LMA may be easier to insert and intubation actually could be successfully done through an intubating LMA, but you need a bigger mouth opening in order to put the intubating LMA in. Recommendations for anticipated difficult airway management. So they are not invasive approaches that you can follow. Identify a preferred sequence of devices. Combination techniques may be performed and they actually might be more successful. Beware of the passage of time, the number of attempts you are doing, and the oxygen saturation. Provide mass ventilation after each attempt when possible. Limit the number of attempts of tracheal intubation to avoid any potential injury and complications. Again, if you are taking an invasive route, identify a preferred in intervention. Ensure proper training in invasive airway techniques whenever possible. Identify an alternative. Always have a plan B in mind. Initiate ECMO when appropriate and available. So now we will move forward to the airway management of patients in the setting of COVID-19. So the airway management is itself complicated in the presence of COVID-19. And there could be any some additional problems that these patients can have if they have an underlying ankylosing spondylitis and that we will go over in the next few slides. So our third case is of a 78-year-old man with progressive motor weakness and numbness after a fall. Past medical history is positive for ankylosing spondylitis, hypertension, diabetes, colon cancer, status post resection in 1991, and panic attacks. On the day of presentation, the patient had a panic attack at home, received 0.5 mg clonazepam from the sister, a few hours later was helping sister up some stairs, and he fell. He did not hit his head or lose consciousness, was able to get up after a fall, but noted a severe back pain after that fall happened. Later the same day, began to have motor weakness and numbness of bilateral lower extremities and eventually progressing to complete paralysis. So the CT scan showed fractures that were extending from C5 to T1 as well as ankylosing spondylitis and they were commuted bilateral lamina pedicle fractures without any fragments in the canal as well as the thoracic spine was done and there was an epidural hematoma that was noted from C6 to T7, T8, and there was a ventral displacement of cervical or thoracic cord, and there was a significant evidence of cord compression. Intermittent hypotension was treated with norepinephrine infusion, and the patient was transferred to a tertiary care center for further management. The so patient reported numbness of the lower extremities as well as below nipples, was unable to move bilateral lower extremities, and the pain was noted on um, the cervical spine. There was no motor weakness or numbness or tingling of the upper extremities, and no rectal tone was present, and the patient was incidentally found to be COVID positive. The patient underwent a posterior cervical spine fusion with the hemovac drain placement was extubated after the surgery 
failed SLP evaluations and an NG was placed a couple days after the surgery for enteral abscess. The patient eventually had worsening mental status and oxygenation and had a cardiopulmonary arrest on post-op day two. Over the next two days, the patient has progressive worsening of his oxygenation and they were concerned either it, it is because of the aspiration pneumonia or the worsening of the COVID-19 infection. They were worsening bilateral patchy infiltrates and worsening hemodynamics despite the resuscitative measures. And eventually the family decided on comfort care and the patient unfortunately died shortly after. We will go over the association between rheumatic diseases and the outcomes of COVID-19 infection. As compared to general population, um, so this study that was conducted uh, in 2020, they matched the cohort of uh, COVID-19 cases in a large healthcare system with patients who had rheumatic disease and those patients who did not. So they found out there were similar frequencies of hospitalization and death. The need of mechanical ventilation was significantly higher in patients who had COVID-19 infection. So axial spondyloarthritis, as compared to general population, the qu question that was raised early on in the pandemic was, do they have any potential protective effects? So this was a study that was conducted on about 9,000 patients with spondyloarthritis, and there were a lot of patients who did not have any spondyloarthritis. And the patients with axial spondyloarthritis actually had poor outcomes as compared to general patient population. And with matched demographics and comorbidities, uh, there might be a lower risk of mortality, hospitalization, or severe COVID-19 that was noted in these patients. And it was um, thought that some of the medication these patients are on could actually um, be helpful in getting them severe COVID-19. But irrespective of whether they would get more infection or not. If these patients end up getting an infection, at that point of time, the risk of the need for mechanical ventilation was really high in these patients uh, with AS. So here on further analysis, going on to the factors that, that were associated with COVID-19 related hospitalization and death in patients with rheumatic diseases, um, they found there was some association on increased age, more comorbidities, and glucocorticoids use. And the sulfasalazine use was not associated with COVID-19 severity. So the general principles for safe airway management remain similar to the patients who do not have COVID-19 infection. But there are certain things we need to consider in patients with COVID-19 because there's Certain parts of a procedure like mask ventilation, fiber optic intubation, that could be safer in patients without COVID-19. They actually um, increase the risk of aerosolization and risk of more provider exposure in patients with COVID-19 and may not be the best techniques to follow in these patients. So we need to have a multidisciplinary approach to these patients. We need to have a meeting with different teams and come up with a better plan so that we can manage these patients well without any extra exposure to our providers. So recommendations for safe airway practices in patients with ankylosing spondylitis and COVID-19. Coming on to the ventilation, consider deferring mass ventilation initially. Use a non-rebreather mass to pre-oxygenate and if a mass ventilation is absolutely needed, do a two-hand mass ventilation and avoid any movement of the neck of the patient. Intubation, video laryngoscopy is a preferred method. Second generation supraglottic devices can be used after the loss of consciousness. An alternative to mass ventilation between the laryngoscopic attempts, these supraglottic devices can be used. In case of emergency, if a front of neck airway is needed or a surgical airway is needed, scalpel bougie techniques are preferred over the cannula techniques to prevent any excessive aerosolization. So early intubation may be needed, but we need to make sure 
that we do not preemptively intubate these patients if they do not require intubation because that can actually lead to prolonged uh, morbidity and eventually might lead to increased mortality of these patients. So coming on to the multidisciplinary planning for AV management in patients with AS and COVID-19. So this is the key point that we need to keep in our mind that the AV management of these patients with COVID-19 that really involves all the care teams to be involved, have a discussion before we move forward for the AV management. Ensure there's a proper staffing and proper person protective equipment that is available. Prepare for any potential emergency airway management. Assemble alternatives to fiber optic intubation tools as a part of intubation preparation process. And if possible, avoid fiber optic intubation. And place a difficult airway sign as we place in any other patients with AS in COVID-19 patients as well. And these should be placed at places which is visible to the teams who are coming to intubate these patients. Educate other providers about the potential dangers of spinal manipulation, whether it is during the airway management, positioning of these patients, prone positioning of these patients. should always keep in mind that special precautions need to be taken for these patients with AS. So now moving forward to other considerations in the care of patients with AS. So preoperative assessment of these patients is really important, and these following points should be considered. Assess the range of motion of the joints. Consider C-spine imaging to determine the potential points of weakness. Assess extension and flexion with radiologic screening, and identify and document any neurological deficits that are pre-existing and evaluate the extent and severity of the features of ankylosing spondylitis, and then come up with a plan based on this assessment. Moving forward to the respiratory or the pulmonary considerations in patients with AS. There is a restrictive lung disease due to the fusion of costovertebral joints, which can limit the chest expansion, pulmonary fibrosis that mainly occurs in upper lobes, in preoperative pulmonary function tests and arterial blood gas analysis is recommended in patients with AS. Moving forward to the cardiac considerations, aortitis can be present in these patients. These patients can have valvular disease. There could be conduction abnormalities. There could be an impaired left ventricle function. And the preoperative electrocardiogram as well as echocardiogram is recommended. Another key point to note in patients with ankylosing spondylitis is prone positioning. Prone positioning of patients with ankylosing spondylitis could be extremely dangerous. So we utilize prone positioning to optimize the oxygenation and lung function in patients with ARDS in the ICUs, but it could be extremely dangerous to position prone the patients with ankylosing spondylitis. There is a risk of iatrogenic spinal cord injury in patients with AS. There was a case report that was recently published showed the report of spinal fracture leading to cord compression and flaccid quadriparesis with prolonged prone position ventilation in the patient with undiagnosed asymptomatic ankylosing spondylitis. And if prone positioning is absolutely necessary, ensure there's a proper planning between the different care teams, use prone positioning beds, and avoid any forcible movements. And neuromuscular blocking agents should be avoided, and if they have been used, you should avoid any forcible movements or any excessive extension or flexion or movement of the spine in these patients because that can lead to catastrophic complications. I would like to go over um, the mortality in hospitalization patients with ankylosing spondylitis. So I would like to highlight here, if the patient's ankylosing spondylitis develop a spinal cord injury, their mortality is way higher in the patients without any spinal cord injury. So I, we should avoid any kind of iatrogenic injury to the spinal cord because it can lead to worse outcomes in our patients with ankylosing spondylitis.
So moving forward to more complications that are associated with spinal cord injury, you could see in the, if patients have cervical uh, spinal cord injury, the complication rate is really high. Um, by fracture location, again, the cervical spine cord injury, the in-hospital mortality was highest, as high as 7.9%. And in the presence of spinal cord injury, the post-operative complications were really high. So our main goal in these patients is to prevent any spinal cord injury, whether it's during positioning, whether moving these patients, whether it's during the airway management because the outcomes are way worse if these patients end up getting a spinal cord injury. So coming on to the summary for our presentation today, ankylosing spondylitis is associated with spinal stiffness, deformity, and there is increased risk of vertebral fracture. Anatomic and physiologic changes can affect the cervical spine and airway, leading to difficult airway management, increased risk of spinal cord injury with the standard medical procedures. So the straightforward direct laryngoscopy that we are using with our patients who do not have AS or do not have any difficult airway may not be the ideal for to use in patients with ankylosing spondylitis. And we may have to go to different techniques like a video laryngoscope, fiber optic intubation, or even the use of LMAs and intubating LMAs. First responders, anesthesiologists, and all healthcare providers should be aware about the risk of any inadvertent spinal cord injury in these patients. And that could be during the hospital stay, ICU stay, during the operating room, positioning of the patient. Careful consideration should be given prone positioning of these patients or any kind of manipulation that involves the spinal cord or positioning of these patients could actually lead to worse outcomes, should always consider that these patients have AS and they could be at the risk of increased spinal cord injury with the routine procedures that we do for our patients. The best practices include recognition and assessment of the risk of spinal cord injury in the pre-hospital, hospital, and pre- or perioperative settings. Avoidance of any maneuvers and procedures that may increase the risk, like the use of cervical collars, rigid backboards in the pre-hospital settings, neck extension for the endotracheal intubation or any positioning can lead to catastrophic complications in these patients and we need to pay special attention while doing these procedures. Then appropriate use of video laryngoscopy and fiber optic technology should be used. You should always have a plan B, plan C in mind. And a lot depends on the available equipment and the clinical skills of the providers. So additional help, if needed, should be appropriately called in the management of these patients. Education and communication to raise awareness about the potential risks that are associated with the routine care, even x-rays, MRI positioning, proning, bed sore prevention positioning. These simple procedures can actually lead to significant damage to the spinal cord for these patients, and raising awareness is the best way to go. So here are a few resources for our medical professionals that we can share with our providers, even nursing providers, techs, medical assistants, nursing aides. So any members of the medical care team these resources we can share with them so that we increase the awareness about the risks that are associated with these patients. For patients and patient caregivers, family members, we have some resources that are available we can share in order to increase the awareness. So now I would like to share my own experience while I was working on this project. I was uh, scheduled to give anesthesia in MRI location one day. I had a patient who came in the preoperative area who was scheduled for an MRI under anesthesia. So the patient a few months ago had a huge fusion from about C6, C7 down to T10. After a fall, he had uh, cervical and thoracic fractures, and that's why he underwent the fusion. He was a known case of ankylosing spondylitis for many years, 
Um, he underwent an uncomplicated surgery, but after the surgery, he was having chronic pain issues and some numbness and tingling in his legs, and he was following up with the neurologist. So he recently saw the neurologist in the clinic, and the neurologist recommended to get an MRI to see um, what was going on, whether there was any compression from the hardware that was placed recently or any other problems that were going on with his spine. So the patient had scheduled an MRI, so he had severe claustrophobia histories. That's why he could not go in the MRI scanner um, without any anesthetic help. So he was scheduled to get MRI with under general anesthesia. So when I came and saw this patient in the pre-op, uh, the patient's wife was there, and they were really concerned about the ankylosing spondylitis because they were well aware of the risks that were associated with ankylosing spondylitis because the patient had it from a long time, and they were very well read, and um, they knew what risks could be involved. So when I saw that patient, that patient still had a very uh, severe cervical deformity, and there was no way that patient could lay flat. And if I would anesthetize this patient and try to lay them um, flat after giving muscle relaxation, I was worried that I could lead to um, catastrophic complications after this. And that was the whole reason I was um, I got so concerned was my involvement in this project, the reading I had done. And I could see that Long term, I might um, make the outcomes for this patient way worse as compared to what he was now. So I um, tried to see with the surgeon for the patient. So I picked up my phone, called the surgeon. Um, so initially, the surgeon did not respond, but in a few minutes, this I was so thankful that the surgeon gave me a call back and I discussed the situation with him. And the surgeon was really thankful to me that I reached out to him to discuss about the patient because he was like, if we had anesthetized this patient and um, paralyzed this patient and positioned straight on an MRI table, the patient would have easily got fractures above the hardware as well as below the hardware, and that would have led to permanent spinal cord damage and even um, quadriplegia for this patient. And I was really thankful that I was involved in this project and I got that awareness to be able to recognize that my patient was so high risk for um, anesthesia as well as for the positioning that we had to do on the MRI table. And I was so glad that I did not move forward and anesthetize this patient and position him. That could have actually led to um, severe complications for him. And I discussed with the patient, I discussed this with the patient's wife, and they were really thankful for me to uh, contact their surgeon and discuss the concerns that I had. And um, they expressed extreme thanks, even though he was very uncomfortable with the pain he had. So eventually he went back to his neurologist and um, discussed about the concerns, and he never ended up needing that MRI again. Um, but my involvement in this project um, helped me become aware about the risks even more, even though as an anesthesiologist, I have always read about it. But my close experience with the team that I worked with, with the experiences that they had shared and more and more studies that I came across, I was really thankful that I was able to provide the best care to my patient. And I really hope after you go through the CME, you will be able to provide excellent care to your patients um, and prevent any further damage to the spinal cord of these patients or worsen their long-term outcomes um, by the routine procedures that we do for patients who do not have ankylosing spondylitis. Thank you for your attention. Have a great day. Thank you for your participation in this activity. Please continue on to complete the post-test and evaluation. Both are required to claim CME credit.